Get mad merch to promote your site today on Call for Help. Welcome. It's time for Call for Help. Come on, everybody. Gather around. Get Grandma on the sofa, too. We've got something for her. Everybody. Look, technology is part of all of our lives, and this is the show where we explain it. We show you how to use it. We, we show you how to master it. I mean, it, you know, I know a lot of times people look at technology and they go, it's mastering me. I can't stay. I can't handle it. This is way over my head. And that, it, look, this is part of life now, and you really need to be able to master it. But the good news is you can. It's not complicated. It's not hard. Six-year-olds can master it. Of course you can. And that's what this show's all about. It's about teaching you how to use this to make your life better, to have more fun, to, to give yourself leverage in the world. This is episode 428. And ladies and gentlemen, 425 of them have been with, <laughs> I don't know what happened to the other three, have been with Amber MacArthur. How are you? Doing? Hey, I'm doing really well. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. So uh, as always, we like to start the show talking a little bit about what's coming up. And I think you talked about Mad Merch. Mad Who's merch. Mad Merch? Well, I had this idea, <laughs> this is always a good way to start, <laughs> that for people who have created websites or they do podcasts or they have blogs, it's really handy if you think about some giveaways to really promote your website. Oh, I want to know all about yes, this. Yes, it's kind of fun. So actual stuff, when, when you go to a conference, you can give away swag. and you can, yes, yeah, swag, you can direct people to your website. But stuff that maybe not be so, not so, that's not so traditional. We so do pocket things. protectors. That's untraditional. And yes. toothbrushes. <laughs> Yes. I have twi toothbrushes. And beanies. And beanies. We have beanies, yeah, thanks to uh, Nitro Zack and Snaggy at the Joy of Tech. So, yeah, and it's very, and people love it. They want them. You know? They really want them. So it's an, a neat way to kind of promote your site offline. We were talking about, the, we've been talking about this for a while, because I remember I saw uh, stickers uh, at uh, a Macworld Expo. People had, were giving out stickers, and the idea was, like, put stickers everywhere. And it's getting, it's enlisting your users to promote your site. Yeah, it really is. So giving the giveaway, so people, you know, they put pins on their bags. Right. Uh, they put stickers all over their laptops. I have Army pins. They're great. Yeah. So it's just some places that you can go and get some ideas that aren't too expensive. So if you want to spend a couple hundred dollars to really have stuff on hand when you go to conferences or walk down the Perfect. street or go to meetings, then you have stuff that you can give away to help to promote your site. Twit's just hired a director of merchandising. Did you know that? Really? Yeah. A good friend of mine. She's going to be responsible for the whole thing. I expect to, I'm going to make sure she watches this. Bill Jelly is also here. Mr. Excel, he's going to show you how to create reports for every department. You know, different departments, different reports. Mr. Excel will explain all. And Greg McKenzie is here. This is going to be a lot of fun. PSPs, you know, these PlayStation portables. Uh, boy, they had such promise. They're so slick and black and beautiful. And I know I ran out and bought one. And there's some good games, but not a lot. Not a lot. Wouldn't it be cool if you could put some of the classic video games on your PSP? I mean, it's a perfect device, great screen. We'll talk about it. It's a, there's a way to do it. But first, before we go anywhere, I think we should go to Newfoundland. All right, we have Peter on the line from Buren, Newfoundland. <laughs> I think I threw you on that one. <laughs> Hello, Peter. How are you? Not bad, sir. And how are you? Uh, well, wonderful. We're so glad you're here on the show today. What can I do for you? Well, I'll tell you, I have a... Um, an older style motherboard. It's for a Pentium 2 350 okay. processor. Okay. And I'm trying to get a, a newer style, a 40 gig hard drive to work in that motherboard. Yeah. And I'm what having a bit of problem getting it to recognize it. It won't see it at all. No. Hmm. Okay. It's not that it won't see a smaller drive. It's that it won't. See, it won't. When you first boot up, you know, you get the black BIOS screen, yeah. and it shows you the devices. Does it show up there? No, it doesn't. Doesn't even show up there. No. And All I right. went into the CMOS and tried it there, and I've even tried putting in like you can enter it manually by entering yeah, 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 yeah. and cylinders and all right. that stuff. It won't even recognize it then. Yep. I think that uh, that's pretty clear that the motherboard is so old. How old is it, Bob? It's so old, it <laughs> doesn't recognize your hard drive. Uh, and the issue is, Sean Carruthers is going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the issue, Sean Carruthers, is... Um, hard drive. <laughs> uh, actually, I have another idea about what might be causing the well, problem I, there, too. We both know what the, the fix is for this, I think. But uh, why do you think it won't recognize it at all? Um, there may be an issue with jumpering. If you have another drive on the system at the same time and they're both yeah. jumpered to the same thing, sometimes they don't see either at that point. Because unless it's an SATA drive, if it's an right. IDE drive, really any IDE drive should at least show up. 
in the in the the boot up sequence because IDE, despite the fact that we've gone to ultra DMA and all of this stuff, is still IDE. Um, I mean, it, it's it you know it, you might not see the full drive size. That's very common. Uh, you might not uh, you know that's those are the geometry issues you're talking about, Peter. Okay. Uh, but you should at least in the boot up see it. So I'm thinking there's some physical issue uh, if it's jumpering. Um, you know, if you have two masters, for instance, you know that you have a jumper on the back of these that you have. Right. I hate using master and slave because, uh, the, frankly, the connotations are negative. And it's not even technically accurate. It's not like one's the master, one's the slave. One's the primary drive, the drive that holds the, the boot information, the right. operating system, and one's a secondary drive, or actually they're all secondary drives after the primary drive. So here Sean's showing us where those pins are on the back. And if, if, if you have that pins mislabeled. Is there another drive in the... Or in the uh, uh, no, there's not. Is there a CD or uh, any optical drive? There's a CD drive in there. Make sure the CD is uh, jumpered as secondary and that your new 40 gig drive is jumpered as master. Okay. Uh, that would be... That could process, cause a problem if it weren't jumpered at all. The other problem might be the cable, just a bad cable. Uh, you'd be surprised how bad, often cables go bad, particularly IDE cables. They really aren't a very good design. They can get kinked and stop working completely. So if you can find another cable, just to try another cable. But finally, it could be, I suppose, that the motherboard is so old it just doesn't recognize it. If that's the case, is there something he can do? Um, if the motherboard won't recognize it, there are a bunch of add-in cards that are available. They're cheap, too. They're cheap. About $40 will get you a fairly good uh, two IDE uh, connector card. The Promise so, card. Promise uh, yeah. does those, and that, that'll add uh, 133 uh, UDMA 133. That's one of the advantages of it. Yeah. It, will, it will also be the higher speed. Now, to be honest with you, I don't think there's that much speed difference uh, oh. in terms of the bus. The speed difference is all inside the drive, with how fast it spins and so forth, So, uh, or you know, how much cash there is. The bus... Uh, UDMA 33 versus a UDMA 133. I don't think you're seeing right. any difference at all. Right, and then the, it'll clock down to the speed of the drive. But anyway, it, it right. is important not to mix and match the drive sometimes because you can get data corruption if the the interference. Uh, right. So they're, okay. if they're trying to write at different speeds, then right. there can be corruption. There. So, uh, Peter, our, our, I guess to give you action items, uh, okay. the first action item would be try a different cable. Actually, the first action item would be check the jumpers. Make sure the jumpers are proper. And make sure it says master. It's set for master. Yep. Uh, not cable select. Not secondary. Master. Then, make sure you've got a good cable. Try another cable. Uh, make sure the cable, by the way, I do this all the time. Make sure the cable's not flipped. That the that the you know the red line on the cable goes to the number one pin on the motherboard and the same thing on the you usually can't get it wrong on the uh, on the uh, drive because they're keyed mm -hmm. but sometimes on motherboards they're not keyed okay. and, and you could get it flipped yeah uh, so make sure they're not flipped and if neither of those fixes it then you might want to go out and and you can it's not expensive go out and get a uh, a uh, IDE uh, card now you sure that drive works uh, yes I am yeah. okay because that would be another thing if the drive was broken it wouldn't stand. Usually you see it in the BIOS even if there are other problems. It's unusual not to see it on that first boot screen or in the BIOS setup. Uh, I, would, I would think that that's a cable issue more likely or something like that. Leo, what about if you went into um, the website for the for that motherboard and seeing if, see if they had a update for the BIOS. Certainly wouldn't be a bad idea with a motherboard that old. They probably do have an update and, it, and it's always a good idea. Uh, but make sure you very carefully follow the instructions for the BIOS update because okay. you can make yourself a very expensive brick. <laughs> I've done yeah. it. You laugh. You'd think I would know better. They're very clear, for instance, that you have to boot a DOS disk, put the thing on a DOS disk and boot to DOS and so forth. I tried to do it in Windows. That wasn't a good idea. Well, not a good idea. Don't unplug <laughs> the machine when you're doing it. It's always a little scary doing a, a BIOS yeah. update. Uh, generally, that's not going to fix the drive issue. Okay. But, uh, you know, it wouldn't hurt. Okay, Peter? Okay. All worth trying. Good luck. Thank you very much, you're... and I really enjoyed the show, and it's been a pleasure. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for calling. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Coming up next, people are going, they're cringing when I'm doing this. This is an old broken drive, I'm sure, right? You wouldn't give me a good drive. It's a good drive? Oh, no! Coming up next, when it comes to Excel, there's only one name you need to know, Mr. Excel. They call him Mr. for a reason. They call me Mr. Excel. We'll see why after the break, as he teaches us to use obscure tricks to get those spreadsheets to work for us. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
be a cheerleader. One of the best things about computers is their ability to repeat tasks over and over without ever making a mistake or getting tired. So if you find yourself tired of doing the same old reports in Excel again and again, whether it's for different departments or separate clients, we've got some trips, tricks up our sleeve. Mr. Excel is here. Bill Jellin, the author of this great book, Mr. Excel Teaches Excel or Learn Excel from Mr. Excel or something like that. About 800 pounds of Excel goodness in there. Once again, it's pivot table time. Pivot table time. My favorite Excel obscure Excel feature. Okay, so I wrote this book. I also wrote the book Pivot Table Data Crunching. Which I have. Which is the book about pivot tables. And so that is the greatest okay. book, and I highly recommend it. And I now go out and I do a Power Excel seminar, one or two hours. All right. And I was doing the seminar, and this lady named Sylvia from California, second row, raises her hand and says, why don't you talk about the show pages feature? And you went, huh? I said, I've huh? never seen it. I have no idea what it is. And so I had her come up. I and, love this. And uh, she showed me this trick, which is the most amazing thing in all of Pivot Table. So I am now have to rewrite the book to include this. So you weren't embarrassed that you didn't, you, Mr. Excel, didn't know this? I learned something at every seminar. I think that's the great thing right. about it. There's no way you could know everything. Exactly. It's such a deep program. And you know, so then I take those tricks and I put them in the book. Or right. You steal them. Steal them. Thanks, Sylvia. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. you are. <laughs> Uh, this one was amazing. So pivot tables. We've done pivot tables before. Mm -hmm. I have 500 rows of data, and I want to create a quick summary. Yep. 500 rows of data. Now, a pivot table, for those who, who haven't used it before, is really just another way of viewing data in an Excel well, spreadsheet. It's a great way of creating a summary without doing any Very formulas fast. at all. You showed us that before. I right. think it's really great. Okay, so, so here's our table. I'm going to create it's a plain old table. Uh, right. You know, I'm, I have some data here. I'm going to start with data, pivot table report. And this is where people probably go south. They go, oh, I don't yeah, know what to yeah. do here. Good news. In Excel 2007, it's actually easier. Oh, that's good. OK, so here's the layout is where I build the report. And I say, let's say uh, um, maybe we want to have a report by product. So, so those are fields or ranges uh, yes. or columns. And right. you're dragging them. To and the this report. is the key. It's the same spreadsheet, but you're just showing a different way of looking at it. Exactly. So this would create a report by product. Um, maybe. A, if I put products across the top and dates down the side, that would Look create a nice, easy little, that is to, to change. nice yeah. little summary report. And we'll click Finish. And that quickly we get our report. Wow. OK, now, the one field that I did not include here is the, um, the page field. And let me go back and add a page field in. A page field basically lets you do ad hoc reporting. So if I put a page field in, now I see all regions. But I could very quickly choose just Ontario and see the report for Ontario. Oh, that's neat. OK, so that's always been in pivot tables, and most people right. know about that. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to see a report for each region, you would have to go through one by one by one, select the next one, print it, select the next right. one, print it, select the next one, print it. So here is the tip that Sylvia showed me. Once we have a page field set up, I go to the pivot table toolbar, and all the way down at the bottom, I choose Show Pages. Why do I think Sylvia sounds like this? Oh, honey, all you got to do is go to the Show Pages. <laughs> Does she sound like that? No, no. she doesn't. No, right. <laughs> I don't know why. I just thought that's why. All right. Show pages. And accounting for 40 years. Yeah. And I have to admit, I tried this once, and it didn't do anything because I didn't have a page field. Oh. So I just said, oh. So the first thing is make that page field. Right. I said, this was one of those Microsoft features that doesn't work. And they <laughs> it's forgot a non-existent feature. Right. So we click Show Pages, and it says, show all pages of. I'm going to choose Region. And I click OK. And in less than a second, it's now created every version of the report. So there's and the how do you change pages? Is it a drop down? Well, yeah. So normally you would have to do that. But it actually inserted seven new sheets in my workbook. Oh, they're actually sheets now? Yes. So you just tap go along on the tab. And so the I can send one to each region. Oh, that's so slick. And if there had been 50 customers, if I had Boy, customers up there, a lot of work. in two seconds, I would have all 50 customers. It's amazing. And as always, with tips that Mr. Excel gives you, you never tell the boss that you've discovered this feature. <laughs> right. You say, oh, it's going it to take forever. me days. And then you quickly, you know, you go go to ball game, you have, have surf a, the internet, surf the internet, hour. and then you come out with a report. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Very clever. I hope the boss doesn't so have a book. The, Actually, yeah. even if he doesn't it's have a book, this one's not in it. That's how good this is. So is it going to be in the next edition? Yes, absolutely. All right. And that one is going to be for Excel 2007, yes? Correct. That's yeah. right. Yeah. When will that start to emerging? Well, the special edition using Excel 2007 should be out in January. Because that's then, when Excel 2007 comes out, well, yeah, for roughly. The, for the corporate people, it's still <laughs> roughly, up in the air. Yeah. And then pivot table data crunching will be out in March. And then the replacement for this will be out in June. And so. as always, you can get a chapter a week just by absolutely. going to the website, and absolutely free. And as the new stuff starts coming out, I'm sure you'll start shipping that Well, that would be out. good, because there's some people that have now gotten the whole book. And right. so new chapters. There we go. We new chapters. <laughs> I love it. Highly recommended if you like or use, even if you don't like, but if you need to use Excel, MrExcel.com. Tips, books, 
rate daily podcasts, and of course chapters from the, this book absolutely free. Uh, if you want to know more about this segment, go to MrExcel.com or visit our website. Actually, that's probably the best place to call for help, TV.com, and we'll link back to Mr. Excel and all that stuff. Now, speaking of tricks, let's see if we can trick you with today's next tech trivia question. In remote controls, you may see the letters RF. You know, like there's an RF remote control. What, what kind is that? Is that a reticular flange remote control, a radial field remote control, a radial fre radio frequency remote control? Or just, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a really fine remote control. Go to the Red website, give us the answer. We'll, we'll talk about it later on. It's Call for Help continues. Welcome back to Call for Help. Time for our upcoming birthday widget of the day. Here's how you can make sure that you remember people's birthdays. All you have to do is download the upcoming birthday widget, put in all the birthdays you want to remember, and then you can look for the next weeks, and you can look for 10 days, two weeks, three weeks, a month, and make sure that you're always reminded that someone's birthday is coming up. And now we have another caller. We have Brandon on the line from Kiwawin, Ontario. Hello, thank you, Amber. Hello, Brandon. Hello. How are you today? Yeah, I'm okay. What can we do for you? Um, I, I just got a new computer and all these things are on already. I hate that. I know exactly what you're talking about. They put all, it's basically a bunch of ads, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's ads for all this software you don't want. You got Quicken and you got Real Player and all this stuff. Who, did, who, uh, who made the computer? Um, I'm not sure we just got from Best Buy. Okay. Okay, so it's probably their house brand. And you want to get rid of all that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you, you've, t give me an example of, of something you want to get rid of. What, what is it that you want to get rid of? Um, well, there's that Microsoft Office 2003 60-day edition. Yeah, right, this, the trial, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in, a, in the case of something like that, uh, you should be able to find it in the add remove control panel. Have you, have you looked there? Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have stuff that you can't remove that way, but sometimes you do, and sometimes it's not actually installed. And that's the other thing. If it's installed, it will show up in add remove usually. But in that case, I think that that's not installed. That's an installer you're seeing. So all you have to do to that is just drag it to the trash. You don't want that? Just drag it to the trash. It's not starting up. It's not running. If you were to double click it, it would then install the Microsoft Office trial, and then you'd see an ad remove. But you don't have to add remove. You can just throw it in the trash. Right. Now, occasionally you'll get stuff that you can't that you know is is not uninstallable. Usually that'll be kind of lower level stuff that shows up in the system tray. Tell you what, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. This is such a common problem. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to a page that describes the default add-on software that you get with some of the big names uh, and what to do about it. There is, if you had a Dell, there's a program called, I think it's called the Dell Decrapifier that actually <laughs> removes all the stuff that Dell sends you automatically. And, uh, and find, so I'll put links to both of that. Now you don't have a Dell, so that's not a problem. And then finally, uh, I will uh, also put in the uh, show notes uh, uh, a, a link uh, that describes how to get a Windows install disk, because really, the best way to do this is just take the, you, you can't do it with a system recovery disk. And a lot, unfortunately, nowadays, a lot of uh, uh, people who sell computers will, will just sell you a computer with, the only disk that will come with it will be called system recovery disks. And all that does is it blasts it out exactly the way it is that right now that you don't like with all that extra stuff on it, wasting space, wasting time, wasting, you know, your attention. Uh, and so the system recovery disk won't do it. But if you have a real Windows install disk, a, you know, just a Windows install disk, that's the best way to get rid of it. Run that and install a vanilla version of Windows on there, you know. It won't come with any of that stuff. And you can get rid of it all, get rid of all the extra stuff. Um, if you don't have a Windows install disk, and again, I put a link on the website to this uh, information. You often, if you ask nicely, uh, can get a Windows install disk. There may be a nominal fee for it. You may have to trade in your old disks, but that's another good way to do it. I think everybody should, frankly, have a Windows install disk. The system recovery disks are useful, but they don't give you this kind of generic version of Windows that it sounds like you would prefer. I'm with you on that one, Brandon. I hate it. To me, it's basically a bunch of ads that I don't want, and it's wasting all my space. 
All right, Brandon? Yeah. yeah. I thank you for the call. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. Okay. If you think the only way to promote your website is online, no, no. Think again. Coming up, Amber MacArthur and the Web Workshop. She's going to show you some creative ways to promote your site by giving stuff away. You stay right here. We spend a lot of time on Call for Help talking about how to promote your site online, you know, uh, where to go and what to do and search engine optimization. But what about promoting it offline? You know, there are actually ways to get the word out about your website without forking over a lot of cash. Amber's going to show us merchandising in today's web workshop, which I think is a great idea. I know. I, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I was just thinking about this the other day because so often you get these great little pins and the giveaways, all the swag from people who are trying to promote their sites, and so a lot of people might want to know where you can go to get that kind of stuff. We all see the pins with the name on it, and I think that's the, le the least interesting way to do it. We're, we're going to get a little more uh, creative. I was going to actually show pins. Were you? No. <laughs> I'm just no, you weren't. I know you were. <laughs> I know. Don't worry. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to show some places you can go and some ideas, and uh, the first thing we're going to start with is the Nine Rules Network blog mm -hmm. and they have ordered some swag from a company called Mammoth Designs and what they ordered are these pins and the Nine Rules Network just so you know it's a place where you can go to get quality blogs so really well designed blogs good content and so what they're doing they're actually selling these pins for five dollars each oh, wow. believe it or not and uh, you know it helps that they have a really neat looking logo their logo is amazing and the other thing I love is it's very subtle it doesn't say Nine Rules it doesn't say a URL it's just the logo it's just a logo so my my feeling on that is because the logo is the basis of their business. Really, what happens is you submit your site to the network, and then if it gets accepted, you have their logo on their, uh, your site. And so it really is an important part. Now, there's a lot of people whose logos aren't going to be that popular and that recognizable. But I could do that with the Twit logo, the little Twit guy. You really guy. could. I wouldn't, and in fact, I think that would be cool. You put that, it's almost like you're in. It's even right? cooler. Yeah, you're kind of in. Because yeah. if people recognize it, they say, oh, Twit, right? Sometimes the best way to advertise is to hold back a little bit, is to not really put it all out. It really like, go to our site, go to our site. So if you have a really great logo, Logo, it's a good idea to do pins. I'm going to show you where you can go to order some of these pins because I've already contacted them because I want to order some pins for Command N. You have a great podcast. logo too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really fun little logo. It's a command symbol. Um, and here you can go. You can order one inch buttons or pins. And if you want to get them black only, they're only 20 cents each and color 25 cents each. Oh, that's very a expensive. minimum of $5 uh, per order. And it has all the information here. And what I did is I actually checked in with a guy who I know who has a really good blog and he ordered some pins for his own site and he recommended these guys. He said they're really, really good. They're dependable. Um, Mammoth. They're in the U.S. And when I started searching their site, I found out they do other things as well. And they do all client work, so it's not as though they actually sell their own merchandise necessarily. So if you look at their site as well, you can find out that they can do t-shirts and hats and hoodies um, and buttons. And they have reasonable prices, which is kind of neat. Uh, here we'll look at one of the hoodies they did for another company, Ooh, kind wow. of stylish. And uh, also here is a hat they did for another company, which is kind of cool. And you can see this stuff is very well designed. I would yeah. call it high-end design. Yeah. Uh, so someone who really wants to kind of make a, a you know, mark in this space and kind of the web 2.0 space they do some really interesting things and here's another t-shirt design cupcakes. they did for johnnycupcakes.com so you can see it's very slick and the quality of all the stuff from here is quite good so there's the first thing if you want to order anything like pins or hats or anything I suggest the pins in some ways because they're very small they're very easy to, to carry a bag they're with you they're pretty cheap they're pretty cheap so if you go to a conference you can just give them away to people um, and so it's quite simple to do that and you can also put your URL on them if you want to right. if you're not that well known and, and you, maybe the logo isn't enough right. to really promote your site. Right. So it's a really easy way to do promotion. The next thing I want to talk about and Funny enough, I'm showing Valleywag as the site where I read this article. <laughs> Valleywag is the geek gossip site in Silicon Valley. But once in it's a while... It's a guilty pleasure, I must say. It's a bit of a guilty pleasure. Yeah. Once in a while, they have good articles. So they, they, this article is all about how to make business cards that people keep. Now, this is kind of neat because they really talk about um, some simple things you can do, like hire a real designer, say something clever, round the corners to make it look like Web 2.0, leave some white space. So it's kind of neat. They have some examples as well of cards. And one of the things that they talk about in this site is he mentioned 
mentioned uh, someone in the tech industry who every time he goes to a conference, he prints off a new round of cards. And let's say he was at Macworld. He'll say, uh, you met me at Macworld 2006. That's a great and idea. And I love that because I have stacks of business no cards. No idea where I have I have no idea who they are. None at <laughs> all. No way idea. to remember them. And so it's kind of neat. And you can get business cards printed so inexpensively cheap, now. You yeah. can print them at home. So I think that's a really smart way to go before you go to a conference, you know, add that line into your business card, print off 100 of them, and then you can take them with you and, and send them out to people so they remember that you, you I'm met do that at that location. I'm going to that podcast location. expo. That's you a great should, idea. Leo. I think it's really, really a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, on Flickr, I found this really neat pool of business card designs and some really wonderful designs. So for anyone who really wants to hand out a really stylish business card but doesn't know what kind of design they like, you can see there are over 5,000 photos of business cards on here. So you can literally go through them and you can see some, there's some really neat designs. Like this is pretty trendy. Um, also, just some really original designs, very simple. Uh, and you can just kind of look through them to get a sense of what you might like on your business card. You can check them out. And then you could print that off and you could bring it to the local designer. Or you could even try to mock it up yourself. Just something really slick as well. Uh, and also, we can't not mention Cafe Press because they're the place that a lot of people go to print merchandise where you can get your logo on it. It's fairly inexpensive. The only thing that I found about Cafe Press is I don't find the quality of the t-shirts very good. They're, 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 stick, they're really they're they're iron-ons, iron -ons, right? So, so you're not doing the silk screening right. or anything that some of the higher end high end stores are doing, but I think it's pretty good in some ways if you want to go there and you want to just do a mass. It's easy. Yeah, a mass order and it's easy and it's set up well and they're big right. enough and they're dependable. So you can go there and also if you want mugs and, and create to create a store The mugs are pretty good. Yeah, and the mugs and things like that are good. And what's neat about Cafe Press is you really can go there, create your own storefront so people order what they want. Whereas in some of these companies where you get t-shirts printed and we ran into this with Jinx, which is a t-shirt printing company for Command N, we had to actually order uh, X number of t-shirts to stock our yeah. store. Yeah. And then we never end up making any money right. off them because you know all of a sudden we ordered a bunch of women's small t-shirts and they never Nobody sell. Them, but right. all the large are gone really yeah, fast. Get, everything should be geek sized, I found. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's good for you guys, not so good for me. Um, but that, that's another thing that's good about Cafe Press is they'll really, you know, they're not going to print anything until there's an order right, in. So it's right. a smart way to do that as well. So those are just some examples of places you can go to, to get merchandise done. I love the pins. I think it's probably my favorite one. That's a great one. idea. Yeah, and it's really, really inexpensive. And I think it's good to go with oddball items, yo-yos, or we do pocket protectors, as I mentioned, and toothbrushes. It's just things that where people find them, they're not going to say, oh, yeah, here's another pen. They're going to say, whoa, this is odd. A pin is a good one because they might wear it. Yeah. Stickers are great because they might stick them around. Stickers are really great. I think the pins are great. Stickers are great. They're and cheap, I, too. That's yeah, they're the nice cheap. Thing. And then the business cards, I think that also is really, really easy to do. And I love the idea of putting on what conference you're at when you met a certain what person. What a good idea, yeah. All right, for more information on uh, this, to get the goods on getting goods for your uh, site, visit callforhelptv.com. And all the web workshops have been there, going back in time <laughs> and eternity, so there's lots of good information there. Now, let's take a look at the uh, people working on this show. As we go for a break, we'll be right back. Right after this, stay right here. Commercials in ten. Welcome back to Call for Help. Time for a Google Analytics tip of the day. Here's how you can sign up for a Google Analytics account, and you can also paste the code from the account into your website so it will start tracking your stats. All you have to do is add in the URL of your account. We added a fake blog here, and then click on Check Status once you're logged in. And then what it will do, it will give you some code that you need to paste into the bottom of your website, so that will start the tracking within Google Analytics. And now we have another caller. We have Will on the webcam from Thompson, Manitoba. Do you use, uh, have you ever used Google Analytics? Um, no, I don't, you know what, I... signed I, up for an account, but I haven't really done it yet. So. I haven't used it very much. I tend to go into TypePad, which is what I use for my and website they have and blog. And they have pretty good stats in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun to look at that stuff. Though. I love it. It's obsessive. I think Google Analytics is really more aimed at uh, advertising and, and how to, you know, maximize your advertising dollars, stuff like that. But it's very, it's neat that it's free. Hey, Will, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Leo? Wonderful. Wonderful. All I right. hear you're behind me. Should I look? Ah! Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, I'm uh, having a little problem. I've been um, copying my DVDs using Nero 7 Recode. Okay. And uh, what I'd like to do is have all my DVD collection uh, on my media center so that I could access all the movies all at any time I want. Right. And I've, I've been, been in the process 
I've copied about 50 of them, and what I'm finding is the volume on the um, on the rip is extremely low. Really? And I find myself having to turn the amp up. Yeah, that's no good. They get a lot of hiss. High. Yeah, and then you and then you forget, and when you watch TV, it's like, yeah, it's really loud. Exactly. Um, I'm not sure why it would be doing such a bad job. First of all, Nero Reco Recode probably doesn't do commercial discs, right? It only does, you probably have to crack it first anyway. I do, yeah. So you're a two-step process. Exactly, uh, yeah. Because commercial DVDs are copy protected. What Nero Recode is doing is taking the VOB files that you get when you rip it with DVD decryptor or whatever, uh, and converting that to MPEG-4, right? So it's a single file that you can then play back. That's right. Um, I think, uh, pr you know, at some point in the process, is the DVD decryptor result, uh, is the VOB file, if you play that back, does that level okay? Yes, I find that just That fine. one's fine. So it's whatever D Nero uh, Recode is doing. Got you know, it. what I would think might be a better thing uh, to do is a, is a one-step process, which is a program called Shrink to Five. It's, uh, d uh, it, it, it does the un- you know, de decrypting, the uncopy uh, protecting, and then it also will then, if you ask it to, it'll do stripped down versions, including APEG-4 versions. Okay. And we've, it's free. We've had very good results with it. Um, I, know, I know almost everybody around here, that's what they end up using if they're using Windows. Um, I do the same thing uh, on the Mac with, uh, with a couple of different programs, Mac the Ripper and uh, 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 Handbrake. And I love the idea. I keep them on my hard drive. I don't use Media Center, but I keep them on, it's for, for traveling. Yep. I don't want to bring 12 DVDs with me, so I just I use Handbrake to convert them to MPEG-4 files on the hard drive. The Shrink to 5 will do exactly the same thing. Okay. Why don't you give that a try? I think it's, what, what happens is when it's recoding, it's actually transcoding. It's taking the MPEG-2 files uh, and the AAC audio in the MPEG-2 files. It's actually not AAC, AAC it's AC-3. And converting it into uh, you know, a format on your hard drive, uh, MPEG-4 and probably uh, AAC. Uh, files and it's obviously when it's doing the audio encode it's doing something wrong okay uh, you might look and see if there's a normalized button in there or something to get the levels up but I think it's just a I think it's probably just not the right program shrink to five is a very good program and it eliminates that middle that sec first step it does it all you know you put this DVD in and it converts it to an MPEG-4 file there and then and you're done now, is there anything out there that will be able to fix the movies that I have already? Yeah, or? you could probably normalize them. I don't, you know, that's an interesting thing. Is there, an, what we need is an MPEG, what, is MPEG-4 the file format that you convert to? Yes. Um, the, the, what, you're, what you want to do is call, something called normalizing, which is getting all the auto, audio level to a nominal uh, zero dB or thereabouts. And I, I, you know, there are a lot of programs that do this in audio for MP3s and so forth. Um, yeah, I just did a Google for MP4 normalize, and there are, uh, there are programs that will do that on, uh, on video as well. Okay. Um, so, yeah, because you probably already have a bunch that you want to fix, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would look and see if there's a normalizing feature in Nero uh, for video. You, you know, you, it certainly will have one for audio, but the question is, will it have one for video? And if not, I see here a number of programs that will do it. Okay. That you, you, what you need is that, it's, as usual, it's just if, to have the Google search work, you need the right term, and the term is normalize. All right. Okay, well. Perfect. Thank you very hey, much. Hey, thank you for calling. All right. Have a good Take day. Care. Take care. All right. Isn't it annoying? Don't you hate it? When you go to MySpace and someone's profile song starts blaring out of your computer, Marcella. Well, if you're a Windows user, you're going to love this free download. It'll let you mute and unmute flash audio in your browser. Are you, are you showing Mikey this? <laughs> well, actually, yes. we're having some audio problems. Oh, Mike's but, working on the audio. Yeah, we're here. working on the audio. Is it really loud? It, it's okay. Uh, so, Mikey has to hold the cord while we do this? Yeah, it's a high tech, very high tech. All this right. isn't, it's a free download and it's called Flash Mute. And this does happen on, on for some reason, on MySpace a lot, that the songs are yeah, really Yeah, what loud. happens when you go to MySpace is so there's flash audio that it will pop up Marcella. our video. And it gets kind of frustrating Marcella. because, yes, Marcella, my friend Marcella, <laughs> who is one of Leo's MySpace friends. My only MySpace friend. Yes, she, I have it as well. So I have audio on my site when you come there. You have your uh, favorite song on there? Yeah, What's I always yours? get different mixes. Well, right now I have a mix of uh, Seven Nation Army. It's I a, love that. Yeah, yeah, so it's a remix it's of a it. It's actually of it. really, really cool. Um, 
Uh, if Not by the white stripes? <laughs> no, it's a remix. What someone's done, they've taken it and they mashed it all up. Oh, so it's just a different version so of I it. Go to your page. Now you're really excited. Now you're going to go to MySpace.com. I think I am your friend. I see my picture. Yeah, you're there. there. Oh, good. One um, of 728. Oh, Leo, it's okay. <laughs> you're up there. You're number three. See, okay, there you are right there. there. So this is a Windows only free file. And what it does is it sits right down here in the taskbar. So we see it right there. You can probably have to zoom in on it a little bit. Um, and then if you right click it to see the settings, you can see that what you have to select as one of the settings is to mute whole browser. What that will do, oh, that, will, that will make sure that anytime there's flash audio uh, coming out of your computer, that it will be muted. Now, I don't have it enabled right now because there's a hot key that's Control-Alt-M. And uh, that's nice too. So if you go to a site and it's really loud, all of a sudden you can hit control all that. Well, well, what you should do is you should have it turned on. So right now I have it, you know, if I don't have it turned on, right. but you have the capability to turn it on and turn it off. Right. So what I would do if I could hear audio right now, I would click <laughs> click control. If Mike Alt were doing his job. Hold that, M, hold that cord, Mike. And then I would click it again as well to make sure that the that's audio right. went we off. We get the idea. So Mike, actually, we don't need you. this is the perfect demo because it actually stopped the audio from playing. <laughs> but we really want to hear the song, so maybe at the end of the show we'll be I able to hear the hear song. I do want to hear it. I want to hear so it's very simple, sits in the taskbar. What you want to do is you want to enable everything. Um, you want to make sure that you say mute the entire browser, right. then it will work. But if you decide you go somewhere and there's flash video or audio and you want to be able to then hear it, undo. that's when you undo it. So what you want to do is the setting should be that it's always on. And then to turn it off, it's Control Alt M. Got and it. that's the hotkey to turn it off, turn it very on so you handy. can hear the audio if you want to. What's it called? It's called Flash Mute. Flash Mute. Windows only, free. Free, Windows only. And it does free. work well. This is our own audio issues internally. Oh, it has nothing to do with that. Yeah. yeah. But it's working. See, it's quiet. Yeah. Hey, gamers, are you ready to experience, oh, by the way, links to Flash Mute and all of our free files available at callforhelptv.com. Are you ready to experience your PSP like you've never experienced it before? There's nothing like playing Ms. Pac-Man on a $500 PSP. You don't have to buy the latest games. Play the old games. Hack it to get your uh, favorite classics on there. But first, one more chance to take our next tech quiz question of the day. When you're talking about remote controls, you see the RF there. It's an RF remote control. What does that stand for? I think it's a reticular flange. No, maybe it's a radial field. Could it be radio frequency or maybe just really fine? Go to the website, give us the answer. We'll talk about it. we call for help continues. There are two kinds of remote controls. There's your IR remote controls and there's your RF remote control. What does that RF stand for? Radio frequency. Those go around corners, through walls, up and down stairs, unlike the IR infrared ones, which are line of sight. Hope you got that right. The PSP world continues to fight for its right to party. For every critic saying there's too many limitations on the handheld gaming, gaming device, or as I say, there's not enough great games, there are those who believe the sky's the limit when it comes to PSP possibilities. In fact, it turns out to be one of the most hackable and exciting devices out there. Greg McKenzie is one of these guys who loves to hack his PSP. He's going to show us how we can put our classic video games on our PSP. That's it's right. about time. We need some good games on there. <laughs> now, uh, one of the problems with PSP hacking is that Sony doesn't seem to like it so much, which is dumb. Yeah, I think. they should really support it, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it opens up the device to so many right. more, so many more possibilities. Than so one of the ways Sony's been fighting this is by upgrading the firmware, right. and turning off hacking. What firmware do we have to be using for this device? To be um, in order to successfully emulate. Uh, Nint the Nintendo emulator, which we'll be showing, right. uh, you need a 1.50. So if you upgrade it to 2, right. you're going to have to you, downgrade. You, you can downgrade 2.5 and 2.60 back to 1.50. Okay. But nothing later than that? No, unfortunately not. They're, at the they're mean. <laughs> they don't want you doing this. So the best deal would be if you could find uh, either if you never upgraded your PSP or you could find right. an old PSP. eBay is a good place to find them. eBay. Yeah. I suppose the ones that are selling in the stores now are probably free. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Way past one point. Well past the uh, ability to hack these. So, well, there is an emulator, huh? Yeah, um, I'm going to demonstrate the Nintendo emulator. This is, is psphacks.com. Right, right. psph-hacks.com. Right. Okay. Is this your site? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my really? Partners. Oh, you're the guy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. you're the man. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The That's king of hacking. Yeah. All right. So, um, this is our site in which you can download the uh, Nestor J emulator through our downloads area, which is Nestor J. J. And this is an NES NES, emulator. the Nintendo. We're really talking the old, <laughs> old school. All right. uh, definitely one of my favorites and probably the most stable emulator for the PSP. Is it? Okay, yeah. great. 
So um, to, to who install writes, it, it's incredible. Who writes these, by the way? This is written by a fellow by the name of Ruka. He has to be pretty devoted because it's yeah. not like the development environment for the PSP supports what he's doing. No, exactly. He's uh, <laughs> a, a, a Japanese developer yeah. who's wow. devoted a lot of time to this, definitely. Um, so to install it, it's incredibly simple. It's simply dragging and dropping files to your memory stick. That's one nice location. thing about hacking. Now, how big a memory stick do you need? Because it comes with a 32 meg memory stick. Uh, really 32 megs is sufficient enough? for the emulation of it. It's such a memory. small, I mean, really, the NES was not very sophisticated. It's a really no, yeah, a small little program. It's not a hard uh, system okay. to emulate, that's for sure. Now, the next step, we've got the emulator running. Right. Um, the next step is basically to locate your ROMs, which uh, you have to obtain those yourself, but we won't tell you how to do that. <laughs> and the reason is, most of the time, these ROMs are considered still in copyright. There, right. uh, while nobody may be selling these games anymore, uh, and there's probably no money in them, uh, they're still in copyright. So yeah. technically, it's illegal to distribute these ROMs. Right. However, pretty easy to find. Oh, simple Google search. <laughs> <True. laughs> there are a lot of emulators out there. Now, now let me ask you this: uh, 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 an emu so if an emulator is written for a PC or a Mac or PSP, it would use the same ROM, right? The ROM yeah, is the correct. actually original. The ROM doesn't. They're the game cartridges. Yeah. As, far, as far as the ROM is concerned, you're playing on a Nintendo. So it doesn't know yeah, any better. Exactly. Wow. All right, well, let's see. How does this work here? Um, well, I already have Nestor J installed. All right. Like I said, it's just a simple drag and drop. I to think the I'm going to have to work this out. I'm going to have to hold it. So turn okay, it on sure. and get it to where it is, and then I'll hold it and you can <laughs> manipulate it, all right? Because uh, we have to get the camera shots here. Okay, well, here's right. actually uh, 1942 successfully emulated <laughs> on the Nintendo. And I bet the Nintendo does pretty well because it's a very, it's a good high resolution screen. Yeah, yeah definitely. This was kind of like Zaxxon or uh, your 1942. 1942. Well, go ahead and play. Can you play it upside down and backwards? Uh, I can. <laughs> hey, Ginger Rogers could dance upside down and backwards. You should be able to play upside. That's pretty cool. So it does use the full screen. How about the controls? How well do they map to the? the uh, they're the actually controls. customizable. You can bind. So the, you can like, say, I want this to be this. Yeah, you can. Yeah. A, B, or whatever the Nintendo had. And how many games, NES games, are there out there? Uh, hundreds thousands. of them, yeah. 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 <laughs> if not thousands, definitely. Yeah. Do you find that you end up, I'm going to play this a little bit, do you find yeah, that you ahead. end up playing the old games more? Uh, goodness, yeah, quite frequently. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is so crazy. <laughs> Can you see that? <laughs> Now, what about sound? I'm not hearing any sound. Is there sound actually emulation? disabled at the moment? Because this oh, okay. game is really annoying with sound. It's really bad. <laughs> but but the full sound support and everything for the yeah, yeah wow, definitely. that's amazing. And even the latest version in Esther J also supports uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. So if there's a two-player game, you oh, can actually use me. another PSP and go against your partner. Oh, you can. Yeah. Did the NES support that? No, it's just the, uh, the person who uh, developed the emulator added that functionality to. What a hack. Look at that, 1942. And how do you insert coins in the PSP? <laughs> I'm just curious, because I don't see a coin slot. You put it in the, in the memory stick slot? Is that it? You just kind of jam the quarters in that way? That's very cool. So if you want to know more, psp-hacks. Dot com. We got some in-depth tutorials explaining everything you need to know. Do you know. explain how to downgrade your? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's all on there. There's well. actually uh, under the PSP hack section. There's a ton of tutorials. Did you do this full time, or do you actually have a real job? I have a full time. You job You can't also. make a living hacking PSP. No. <laughs> all right. <laughs> He's actually not. a professional web and PSP developer. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Worked for a company uh, just downtown here in Toronto. Oh, that's neat. And an all-around hacker geek. Yeah. Web.net. You should check it out. Web.net. Is that yeah. your company? Yeah. Very cool. They get a little plug. <laughs> as well as psp-hacks.com. You want to know more about that, you go to callforhelptv.com and we'll show you how to get some Nintendo games Definitely. on your PSP. Who cares if they ever put out more games on the PSP? Yeah, I just need Sega, uh, I got, yeah, Se else. yeah. Can you put a Sega on oh, here? Oh, yeah, there's Genesis. There's vast majority of the, <laughs> Can you put an Atari? Yeah, yeah, there's Atari. Oh, there's man, everything finally I can do something with my PSP. <laughs> we'll be back with some final words right after this. You stay right here. So you have all that. Welcome back to Call for Help. I'm Leo Laporte. Amber MacArthur is here. You know, we showed you a little earlier. She was showing us how to turn off the music on MySpace. We thought it'd be kind of interesting to talk a little bit about yeah. MySpace. It's kind of out there. Everybody knows about MySpace. Well, There's something like 50 million users in one year. It's amazing. Yeah, I think they're up to 90 million 90. users. 90? Yeah. It's funny because about four or five months ago, they were at 80 million, and now it's at 90 million. Unbelievable. That means everybody in the, in the world is using it, pretty much. Pretty much. Everybody under 25, anyway. Yeah, there's a lot of people using it. What's really neat, I think, too, is there are people using it for promoting their 
their movie, promoting their band. They've been using it for that for a while. Well, that was the original idea mm -hmm. for MySpace, was promoting independent music, right? It really was. And I saw a movie trailer last night on television. And what they did is they pointed people to the MySpace account for the movie. Wow. Uh, I can't remember the name of the movie, but it was really, when you start to see that, you realize how mainstream it's become. There's also in Wired Magazine this month, there's a music, it's a music special, and they talk about MySpace and how the Bare Naked Ladies, which is a good Canadian band, is using MySpace to really launch a lot of their music, their albums, and really promote, and they're really focusing totally on the social networking side of it. So, for somebody like me who doesn't really know, is it a blog? What is MySpace? Is it like Live Journal? Is it like Blogger? What exactly, if I had a MySpace account, what would happen? I would actually call it a personalized homepage with networking capabilities. So, it's something where... Social networking. Yeah, social yeah. networking. So, you can go in, you sign up for an account, you can put your profile, so that's your name, your age, all that information, your photo, and then um, you can also do blog entries. Show us. You can take a look at my MySpace. Site. Yeah, okay. this is my MySpace account. I uh, have one too. I'm yeah, so here we go. Um, I, I spent a lot of time there hanging and chilling. <laughs> so you can send messages to people here. What you you can do really easily is you can go into the music gallery and you can add a song to your profile. The kids always do that. And yes. by the way, you have a, it, a lot of popular music on there. You can, oh, there's a ton of popular movies, music, so you can easily add Is this something you uploaded, or is this something that you found it's on It's something I found. So what you do is you go through all the music, and all you do is click Add. So those musicians who are OK with you adding their music to their site, to your site, will say that, hey, that's all right. You can add it easily. And Abby, my daughter, has done that. And she changes it regularly. That's one of the things she does a lot. Oh, yeah, that's part of it, too. You're supposed to change it all the time. She also has a really ugly background. <laughs> I think that's one of the things the kids like to do, because you can do a little HTML to it. Right? Yeah, you can customize it. I haven't really done anything. Thing. But here's where all your friends are. So up here you have your profile information, your song, Why and you can you change the, this can around. You stop the song for yeah, a no it's problem. Crazy. Uh, and this is where <laughs> you have. I'm an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you have all of your friends. Uh, I have seven. How does somebody become friends. your friend? What happens is they find your profile on MySpace, and then they send you an email that they've requested that they want to be. Um, they want to add you to their MySpace accounts, and you, they want you to add them as well. You're friends with Dr. Tiki. Yes. Wow. Tiki. I'm so yes. jealous. And Mohit and Mike Laz, you, Leo, Marcella, Brian, um, Andrew from Rockaboom, and I, I don't really know George Dombolopoulos. How'd you add him, though? I requested an invite, and he accepted he me. He accepted? So that's the other way it can go. You can say, I want to be your friend, and you can send them yeah, an invite. Yeah, it goes both ways. So I can automatically add anyone as my friend, but whether or not they will reciprocate and add me is really up to them. I see. And so, so they then, wouldn't show up there unless unless they said okay. Yeah, they need to they need to actually say okay. And what happens, though? Somebody's your friend, big deal. What does that mean? Um, it doesn't really mean anything. Thing, but there's some type <laughs> oh. of, uh, you know, you get a lot of credit for having lots of friends. I mean, there's people with thousands and thousands of friends on MySpace. There's somebody with fun. 50 million friends, right? Somebody oh, has I'm like sure. everybody. Yeah, I'm sure. It, it's kind of interesting, too. I was reading another article in Wired magazine about a producer out in Hollywood who um, does a bunch of television shows and how they actually find some of their theme songs from MySpace. She wow. actually goes in and she tries to find indie artists that she can then use their songs and get them to play on MySpace. I think parents are very worried about MySpace because uh, you, you hear stories about you know adults preying on children there and so forth. What, what, what's your take on that? Well, I think it does happen. But you know, the way I look at it is a community with 90 million people, there's going to be bad things going right. on. And, uh, you know, there are some restrictions built into MySpace, so certain people over a certain age, over 18, can't talk to and add friends to right. ask, request friendship with anyone under 16, but you can't really enforce that. So, right. in my view, it's more about the parents really understanding where their kids are on MySpace. I make sure Abby's profile is private, not public, mm -hmm. and I try to make sure that all of her friends, the people she chats with, are people she knows in real life, so that that way she knows their kids, because she knows them. Yeah, that's much that better. It seems like a sane precaution. Yeah, it really is. But I can't, I don't keep her off, because you know what, this is part of their life now, isn't it? It's amazing. It really is. Yeah. We're out of time. I thank you so much for being here. If you want to ask a question, go to our website, callforhelptv.com. You can also sign up for the newsletter there. Uh, if you've got a problem with your personal technology. Don't whine. Don't moan. Don't yell. Just call, call for help. help. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.